Good afternoon and welcome back to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We are continuing our discussion on S30 and finishing up um, some testimony that, uh, that we started before the uh, lunch hour. So I would like to welcome back Mr. Chris Bradley. Well, thank you, Amber. Am I allowed to share my screen? Yes, I'll make you co-host. Thank you very much. Sorry for the inconvenience. Just very quickly, and thank you for uh, allowing me back in, uh, Chair Grad. Um, I, I'm not sure I adequately addressed uh, 4062, which is a new statute um, included as Section 4. Um, just wanted to say that we have no objections to this section, uh, and we're not sure at this point whether it's covered, but we were wondering uh, if we could get some information. Uh, I think as Representative not uh, suggested earlier, we're always on a quest for more data. Um, and if it's already uh, uh, available, forgive us, but uh, we'd like to know the number of firearms uh, have been, that have been relinquished through our pro, uh, extreme risk protection orders, um, and then what the disposition was, uh, if anything, of those. Uh, with that, unless there's any questions that uh, have come up over the lunchtime from my pre previous testimony, um, I thank the committee for your time uh, and really look forward to working with you folks. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, any questions? Again, uh, uh, it's hard to see everybody's hands. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me shut my, right. there you go. Apologize. No, no, no worries. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we will um, try to get that information for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great, you bet. Uh, okay, that brings us to uh, Mr. Bill Moore. Uh, do I see you? I'm not sure I, I don't, I don't think I see him, but no, I don't see him. All right, well, let's, um, uh, let's keep going. And then if he comes back, uh, okay, sorry. How about, let's see, Connor Casey, please. Right. Good, good afternoon, Chair and committee members. It's uh, really nice to be here today. And uh, I wanted to start just by introducing myself. I'm the uh, new executive director of Gun Sense Vermont. It's my, my first week on the job. So, you know, not much of an orientation. They, they pop you right into committee hearings. It's <laughs> but it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, just, just, just to kick it off, um, Gun Sense Vermont, as many of you know, uh, was founded in 2015. Um, in the aftermath of the Sandy Hook tragedy. Um, we have over 4,000 members spread out across the state um, in every county and nearly every uh, municipality in Vermont as well. Our board is made up of advocates from diverse backgrounds, um, including healthcare professionals. So S30 is certainly of interest to our organization. Um, we're in a crisis, both nationally and here at home. I, I think it feels like it can be far away sometimes. Um, but, you know, whether it be the tragedy uh, narrowly averted in Fairhaven or, or the very recent shootings in the past few weeks in Elmore and Holland, uh, these instances really take a psychological toll, uh, not just on victims, um, but on entire communities. And that is what we hear from our membership. Um, so just like in any crisis, like the pandemic we're in, uh, we need to come together to craft solutions uh, that will ultimately save lives. And, and we, we, we're really optimistic that, you know, S30 is a step in the right direction on this. Um, and uh, it, it will make a real and immediate difference here in Vermont. I mean, I'll tell you right off the bat, in, in 2021, I, I personally knew two people who lost their lives for gun violence. Um, so, so it is in our backyards and, and we need to take steps. So we, we do support the common sense approaches laid out in S30 as a bill with a good step forward. Um, without question, firearms have no place in a medical setting. And the numbers provided by Dr. Sexton today are, are they're alarming. Uh, hospitals can be emotionally charged environments. And it, it's so important that we protect doctors, nurses, and patients, because uh, heavens knows the, the, the healthcare professionals are doing so much for us these days. Um, and I think Dr. Sexton is right. It's even more emotionally charged than it has been. Um, along the same lines, Vermont should clarify its existing ERPO law by ensuring healthcare providers are able to provide information to authorities uh, without violating HIPAA. 
And, you know, eventually we, we'd certainly like to see that ex extended to, you know, families, some other folks. Uh, but I, I think that's a really positive step in this bill. Um, we'd also encourage you to, you know, revisit lo looking at um, uh, banning firearms in, in government buildings and child care facilities. Uh, I mean, just anecdotally, you know, I, I sit on the Montpelier City Council here. And, uh, you know, you're, we're privy to a lot of uh, what goes on with the protests on the State House lawn. Um, we, you know, I think it probably affected all of us back in October when we, you know, the, heard that the speaker had been threatened and, um, you know, the person was saying that they had a firearm. So there, there, there may be a need to codify some of this in law as, as well as just having rules around it. Um, even across the state, across the street, we've had some of our election staff uh, receiving threats in the wake of the last election there uh, that have been uh, very nasty and credible in some cases. Uh, so we would love to see, if, if not in this bill, at, at some point it expanded to public buildings and of course child care facilities, uh, which we think would be a logical extension of the schools. Uh, we, we strongly support Representative Knott's amendment to adopt a, a law closing the Charleston loophole. And I, I don't need to talk about that too much because I, I, I think most of the information has been said already. Uh, but really, we need to require that firearms not be sold until a background check is completed. Uh, and, you know, even if it does take longer than 72 hours, <laughs> um, I, I know only 3% are impacted this, the, the number we heard. Um, but th this would keep weapons out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them, help have them and it would help save lives. Um, we do support responsible gun ownership. We really do. Uh, but we reckon he, recognize the need for laws like this to prevent negligent and reckless behavior. This is really positive. Um, you know, I think some of the opponents would oppose this uh, bill under the pretenses of freedom. I, I would argue Vermonters deserve freedom to have safe spaces in, in hospitals and other settings like this. Um, a recent poll, not, well, end of 2020, surveyed 500 Vermonters and found that 74% were either convinced or somewhat convinced that we needed further gun safety legislation to support our children and communities. Um, it's, it's not just a popular thing to do, it's the right thing to do. So in the coming months, you know, as the new director of Gun Sense, we'll definitely be taking our efforts outside the legislative halls, having some community conversations, and we really hope to be a resource for you going forward. Um, as, as we've heard today, the need for more Vermont-centered data. That, that's something we're really making a priority to collect and connect the dots on some of this legislation. Uh, but on behalf of the board, I, I really sincerely want to thank you for the work you've already done. Uh, you, you've shown tremendous courage and taken a, a tripartisan approach in some cases, handling these, these very tough issues. Um, certainly, there's, there's miles to go but we, we'd love to be a resource for you. Um, and again, I, I'd like to keep it short today because so much of the data has already been laid on the table, um, but, but appreciate you taking the time and uh, would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, you said you took a poll of 500 Vermonters. Oh, yes, that actually, and let me clarify, the, the, the poll was conducted by Alliance for a Better Vermont of a random sampling size of 500 Vermonters. Is there any possible way that we could, uh, uh, because I'm really interested in this data, is there any way I could get, we could get a copy of what questions were asked on that? I'd really uh, oh, like absolutely. to- Absolutely, and I, I've got it broken down by, I've got two cross tabs with uh, gender and uh, uh, pol political persuasion. And we found regardless of your political persuasion, uh, the majority in each case uh, favored more common sense gun, gun laws. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any, anybody else? <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very, very much, folks. Have a great day. Great. Hey, um, I see that Will Moore, you have, you have joined us. I'm sorry that I temporarily skipped over you, but you weren't there when we started. So, um, so welcome and look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Okay. For some reason, I wouldn't. It wasn't able to unmute. Um, 
I would defer to Henry Perro if he's on a schedule. I'd be happy to hear his testimony before I proceed, Madam Chair. Mr. Perro, would you like to testify now or, um, or does your schedule um, permit you to be with us longer? Well, it was kind of sort of notice. So yeah, if I could testify now, it would be good. Sure, absolutely. Welcome. Thank you. So I guess I was asked to talk about the background checks, the three day delay, three business days, and also the Charleston loophole that my understanding is why we're here. So my understanding of the Charleston loophole, if this law was to pass, it wouldn't have any effect in Charleston anyway, because the incident occurred, I think it was two months after the gentleman had the firearm. So uh, I'm not sure how this is all going to tie in and how it would help. But when a person comes in to purchase a firearm, we do a federal background check as mandated by federal and state law. We are told yes, no, or maybe. And the maybe is a delay in its three business days. It doesn't start until the next business day. So if it was on a Friday, eight o'clock in the morning when we received this delay, that wouldn't count, Saturday, Sunday wouldn't count. The time wouldn't count until Monday. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if we didn't hear back from the federal government with the NTN number, we could deliver the firearm on the Thursday. That's after we go back to the FBI background check computer and recertify. And then we also have to print out the form and then they have to recertify that the answers haven't changed. So in that scenario, the FBI is open, the FBI background check system is open seven days a week. I, I believe 24 hours a day. So they would have all day Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we could deliver on Thursday. So they do have quite a little bit of time. This, this is a federal law that was set up with the FBI and they deemed that was enough time to do the background check. Some of the other issues with this is Last I knew, there was between 44 and 50,000 John Smiths in America. And I'm sure there are some John Smiths that should not own a firearm, just using that name as an example. But it, it uh, so someone with a common name could be put on delay for up to 30 days under this, under this new proposal. People with top secret clearances in the National Guard or in the military in general, already have an in-depth background check performed on them to receive the top secret clearance. My understanding is, and we get a lot of these who are put on delay, police chiefs and National Guard members, and it's because they've already had an intense background check. And from what I can understand is when the FBI does the background check for a firearm, it goes into the computer and it will show that a background check, a high intensity background check has been done on that person, but it can't tell why. And what will happen is a lot of times that will trip a delay status. And on several occasions, we've had chiefs of police in uniform come in to purchase a new firearm and they get put on delay. They can leave with their firearm that they have on their side, but I can't provide them with a new one for up to three business days. It does apply to them also. Uh, so obviously I'm opposed to it. I believe it would also shut down every gun show and the Barry gun show is coming up and that brings in a lot of money for central Vermont. Every restaurant is booked. Every hotel is booked. So anybody who is getting put on a delay, it's, it's 
it's just not going to work. So that's what I have for notes and I'm willing to take questions and I'm also willing anyone who would like to understand how the background system is performed, I welcome them to come in and we can actually walk through it with the FBI computer. Thank you, thank you very much. I, um, I see Martin and then Tom. Yeah, th thank you very much for testifying today, uh, Mr. Perrell. Um, so the, the uh, gun shows, I mean, do they, how long do those last? I, I thought, aren't those a weekend affair or? or yes. Yeah, because I, I mean, if they're gonna be delayed, wouldn't they be delayed one way or another? I mean, the, there'd be at least the three days. So I just don't see how, I can see how a waiting period that we've talked about before could affect a gun show possibly. But I don't see how the that three the three day uh, the maybe in in the background checks would actually affect gun shows. So under, I want to make sure I have this correct. You're saying that under this bill, if we were to get it back within one or two days, then we could deliver. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the bill is just if there's no answer, you know, if there's not a yes or a no, uh, that it would extend the time to, to allow the FBI NICS to get to a yes or no. Okay. But if the yes comes in a day or two days, then, then yeah, it definitely is allowed to be turned over. Okay. Under, under that, then I would, I would have to say that the, it would be the same. The only issue I could see is the people who are traveling if they could get it back, because a lot of people come, they stay in central Vermont. Uh, it's a huge event, the Barry Gun Show. But if somebody's traveling from, you know, southern part, they may not come all the way back up to pick up that firearm in 30 days. Tom, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Henry, for testifying. I just had a question around the, the Charleston loophole. I, I don't like the term loophole anyway, whether it's got to do with Charleston or taxes. Um, the, the, to me, there's no loophole. We have laws that people follow. Um, but anyway, can you explain exactly what happened with that? Because I think, I know there used to be with me anyway, some confusion around it that uh, the uh, the gentleman, I'm going to guess he was a gentleman, uh, or, or, or uh, that ended up uh, um, triggering this so-called Charleston loophole. I think there's some uh, confusion around that he didn't get the gun within those three days. And, and as you just said, something about two months, I think. But can you explain exactly what happened with that? And, and, uh, and I guess uh, uh, how the system did work. So my understanding, and I, I have to agree with you on the loophole. So there was no such thing as a loophole, especially in this case. I don't have the exact dates, but let's use April 1st. A gentleman came in, purchased a firearm, and he was put on delay. So he had to go through the three business days which works out to, uh, depending on when, but five to seven days. He went back, the gunshot recertified with the FBI to make sure everything was good. And then he delivered, the gunshot delivered the firearm to the gentleman. Two months later, he used that firearm in a crime. So this loophole, that doesn't exist, wasn't even a loophole. Everything, every law was followed. Uh, it, it, a lot of people try to make it sound like he picked up the gun in five days and on the sixth day, he committed a crime. And my understanding, everything I've read, that's not the case. It was approximately two months later. So he wasn't in a situation then where, uh, um, earlier we heard some testimony that there's actually continuing investigation by the FBI for two or three months 
uh, I, I think that's what I heard. Uh, so potentially somebody could, even though they're given their firearm that a few months later, that uh, maybe the FBI could find, you know, a reason they shouldn't have it. But was, was this, uh, in this situation, was there, uh, uh, was the FBI triggered, I, I guess, where, yeah, and uh, I, I don't know the answer. That. Okay, okay. I don't have that answer. Right. But I can say that we have delivered a firearm, and it wasn't a delay status. It was a proceed. And maybe, I don't have the exact date, two, three months later, we receive a call from the ATF inquiring about the person and if we delivered the firearm. And of course we pulled our federal form and we did. And then it becomes an ATF case where they will go and interview and or arrest or retrieve the firearm. So I will have to say there is an ongoing investigation. Right, okay. Yeah, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's three months that the investigation continues by the FBI. But uh, another question that I was going to ask Jeffrey Whalen and still will uh, at some point, but uh, so we we enacted a law where if, if two private citizens are going to uh, uh, buy, buy, sell, trade, swap firearms, whatever, they have to go through an FFL. How many... And I know you sell a lot of firearms. You, I'm, I'm going to guess you probably sell the most in the state. That's just my guess. <laughs> um, but how many of those transactions have you, I, I, I guess the word is facilitated maybe, because they they have to go through you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did run that report yesterday. Uh, I don't have the exact number in front of me. I filed it. But I would have to say a couple hundred. Okay. Okay. Wow. I'm, uh, uh, I'm surprised there's that many. That's all. (laughs) I wouldn't have guessed there's that many in the whole state, but, but that's, that's great. That's great that people are following the law, I guess. Um, and, and, in your experience, um, um, no, I, I guess I'll save that question for Jeff later on. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation, um, on the, uh, the Charleston, I'll call it issue. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ken. Madam Chair, would it? Be, I'd really like. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, what Henry just said, but uh, Mr. Bradley uh, uh, touched on that topic earlier. Could I just uh, get uh, more clarification so I can finally put this to bed in my head from Mr. Bradley again? Is that acceptable? Um, yeah, so um, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So you, um, Mr. Paro, did discuss it, and as well as Mr. Bradley, or is there could Mr. Paro clarify something that? I, I, I just, just want to make sure. I want to. I I would like to know if that's how Mr. Bradley understands it. Also. Okay, and can you um, can you uh, restate your question, please? Uh, Henry just uh, just clarified the Charleston, I'm not even gonna say it, but is that how you described it also earlier, Mr. Bradley? The Charleston loophole, and I, I concur with the, uh, I hesitate to use the term, the, uh, there was no loophole. This was designed specifically to have and keep the FBI's feet to the fire so that there was a decision in a timely fashion uh, they purposely weighted personal rights over failure to have an accurate decision in, in a certain amount of time. In point of fact, the, loop, the gentleman involved in Charleston, if I can use that term very loosely, it turned out that it was, he was not a prohibited person. The sale was allowed to go through under a default proceed, but in the end and final analysis, he was not a prohibited person. And as Henry pointed out, and uh, Madam Chair, thank you for uh, allowing Henry Perro to speak at our request. That was, thank you. Uh, he is the most knowledgeable person in the state. So um, 
just to clarify, uh, Ken, again, it has been repeatedly testified that the person who perpetrated Charleston was a prohibited person. He was not, not at the time, according to the FBI records. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you also, uh, Mr. Farrell. Uh, let's see, uh, Tom and then Martin. Yeah, I, I just had one more question for Henry. Um, in your experience with selling firearms, uh, have you ever had any uh, uh, situations where people were uh, arrested or prosecuted for lying on forms? Or have you had to turn anybody in for it? Yes, we have a pretty good security system. Uh, one of the things we're constantly looking for is straw purchases, somebody pointing out a firearm and then somebody else. Uh, it would be hard for us to say somebody was lying on a form. Common sense, if something's not quite right, what we do is we deny the sale. Uh, and then we refer it to the ATF. We have a good relationship with the ATF. And if yep. somebody comes in and things aren't quite right, we pick up the phone. We let them make that decision. Sure. And how often does that happen where you have to make that decision? Maybe a couple times a year. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Martin, before you um, ask your question, um, I have a question. Mr. Paro, I remember we spoke with you about gun shows um, a few years back. And am I remembering correctly that um, if somebody um, goes home or back wherever they, they came from, um, out of state in the state with, um, at a gun show, and then they are cleared, that it's possible to to mail or deliver that they can still get their firearm? I, I just have that recollection. I wonder if you can help. No. no, okay. No, if, if somebody is from out of state, we cannot mail them a firearm. Can, can they be delivered in any way? Or if they're in state, could they come, come back or? Yes, if they are in state, they can come back. But if they're out of state, you, you know, we just can't mail guns. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just, a, I think a couple questions. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm happy to stop using the terminology Charleston loophole. And, and is it delayed proceed? Is that the, the, the terminology you use, uh, Mr. Perro? Yes, we get proceed, delayed, or approved. Those are the three options. Okay. Um, the other question I had is about the, the uh, form that is filled out. Presumably it's filled out on a computer. Is that right for the, for the background check? Yes. Yeah. And I just want to make sure I have the right form that I, I just looked online trying to find it. Is it the, and it's the firearms transaction record. Is that what it's called? Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's, it's ATF form 4473. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm just going to, uh, I've sent that to Amber just so she can post it and it will be under my name under S30 uh, when she does get it. But but I do note on here that uh, your, your example of, was it John Smith, I think is what, what you, maybe that was the name you used that. Yes. But, but on the form, and I just want to confirm that that's your understanding that it's not just the name, it's, it's a street number. I mean, it's the address, the city, date of birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, height. I mean, there's quite a bit of information to distinguish the different John Smiths. And, and I suppose if you are a John Smith, you can also put in it's optional, uh, which I like that it's optional. Uh, the social security number uh, is, it can be put in as well. I mean, is that, is that information that's usually put in? Do you know when you, when you enter a person's information, how much of that information actually gets entered? Well, we don't enter it. The person does. Oh, okay. So the only thing, excuse me, the only thing that's optional is the social security number. Okay. So the person, you, you, let the, you let the person actually enter that at a terminal. Yes. Okay, great. No, thank you very much. That, that, that's helpful to understand the process. Thanks. So if I may, I'd like to follow up a little bit. The computer 
the FBI ATF computers, they use sound like technology. They use pretty close technology. So in the sense of John Smith, you may have a physical, he is 6'1", 250 pounds. If the date of birth is close, if the social is close, it will still trigger it because it's a similar. So it's not exact when it comes to the delay process. Great, thank you. Thank you, that's helpful as well. Uh, Bob and then Tom. Madam uh, Chair, uh, Henry, I've, I've been to the TS clearance on a couple of different occasions. Thank God I've not run into the example you gave as to walking out of your store without being able to purchase a firearm, which, yeah. Uh, but having said that, <clears throat> as elected officials, the last thing we want to do is to put a firearm into the hands of someone who should not have one. So in looking at the amendment, using the Charleston example from three to now 30 days, uh, I was thinking anywhere between three, seven, or 30 days. Do you see where this is going to make a significant difference if, in fact, we use three days versus seven days or 30 days, Henry? Well, I think it's going to make a difference in uh, the people purchasing with, with the common names, if you will. If they know they're going to get put on a 30 days, they may try to skirt this and then the private sales will go up that are not having background checks. So it could have an effect, a negative effect. Um, I don't think anybody, including a gun dealer, wants to put a hand, put firearms in the hands of somebody who shouldn't have them. But we also have to be respectful of people's rights. The federal government has deemed that they can do the satisfactory background check within three business days. And that's what has been working. Uh, we just debunked the Charleston loophole that it wasn't even a loophole. So I guess, do we have statistics in Vermont where this would have prevented anything? I don't know. So having, having said that, Henry, do you think that we should be looking at Extending this period from like three to seven days on the Vermont level versus 30 days, or what's your thoughts on that? Because you deal with this on, on a daily basis. I deal with it on a daily basis, and the federal government has set up three business days. They run those computers seven days a week, 24 hours a day for background checks. If there's a little bit of a hiccup, that's where they need that three days to maybe go into a different computer, maybe make a phone call. In today's world of technology and computers, three business days is enough in my opinion. I don't think we should extend it. The federal government says three days. Okay, Henry, thank you. Hmm, excuse me, Tom. Thank you. Henry, how many years have we been doing the federal uh, background checks? Is it the 80s? Yeah, I, I don't remember. The first one, you had to send the paperwork to the county sheriff. Uh, and I don't remember what year. Might have been early 90s. Okay. But I, I'm going to guess back then it was all um, uh, handwritten uh, applications and snail mail. Yes. So... Uh, uh, and where I'm going with it. Okay, so with, with, when an application, when a uh, person fills out an application now or, or to, to buy a firearm, is that all submitted electronically? Yes. So, okay, so right there, I mean, in, in the past, I guess if it was, it was three days and we're using uh, 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 handwritten forms and snail mail, Boy, they must have they must have been busting their butts to get that out within three days. Uh, um, and now with the uh, the computers running, like you said, 24 seven and just constantly checking information, it, it makes me wonder, in a sense, how many how many days uh, of, of information are you actually getting in those three days compared to, you know, with the speed that things are done. But uh, the looks like i mean there's already a huge gain there as far as uh, uh timeliness goes and uh 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, the the big argument is the is the Charleston loophole, and you know, that's been debunked. And and uh, other than that, I've I've never heard any other argument for extending these timelines other than Charleston, and and then that's Charleston's fallacy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Any other questions for Mr. Caro? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now we'll turn to to uh, Will Moore. Hey, it worked the first time. I'm unmuted. So that's progress. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Madam Chair and members for having a, a long day and a large opportunity. As you may have seen from a letter that I, I'm sorry, I should identify myself for the record. Um, William Moore, I'm the Firearms Policy Analyst for Vermont Traditions Coalition. Um, as you may know, I've written a pretty strongly worded letter to the members and many others across the political spectrum in the state house, uh, similar to some objections that I filed last year with the Senate Judiciary Committee when they took up the original bill. And previous to the special session um, regarding the accessibility and functionality of the legislature and the legislative process and the citizen access and the citizen participation opportunities here, um, which are greatly truncated on Zoom. It, this is an insufficient process. I wanna register those comments. I wanna point out the letter that I sent the committee and hope that you spend some time reading it. I think it's a thoughtful um, and, uh, and, and, and sincere request that complicated policy issues and other social policy questions that are not truly emergencies or truly responding at least to an immediate problem should be held off until the building is open or at least a strongly hybrid uh, physical presence. And my main concern has been repeatedly, um, you know, citizens may appear to have access, but this is a one-way window um, it's not the same. And the second part of that is that I've come to the conclusion just recently that the largest deficit of this remote session activity for any bill, whether it's complex policy like uh, questions of psychiatrists reporting patients' threats uh, or simpler things like dictating signage at hospitals, um, is the interpersonal and the interaction between legislators themselves. As far as I'm concerned, my dime pays you and my vote elects you to interact with each other. And everything else is the way you gather your information and arrive at your conclusions. But the interaction between you, you between each other is, is the act of legislating and you are not able to do that. So I consider this whole process um, less than legitimate. But to the bill, I've written some notes because I am um, often... Excuse me, um, can, um, can you um, explain what you mean that this process is less than legitimate? Well, I think I just did. I mean, I think the biggest deficit problem is, is your ability as legislators to interact with each other. Um, you know, unless you, unless you reach out through email or phone calls, you're just not in the building. And I'm sorry, I've been doing this 35 years, Madam Chair. Um, I've been in the building on and off since 1988, and there's no there's no valuable replacement, no tenable uh, alternative to physically bumping into Martin in the corner by the water fountain, or running into Coach Christie and talking about something that has nothing to do with the bill, and then stumbling onto someone who has information that I can then pro you know offer to him. But there's certainly no substitute for you two interacting in the hallways or interacting with a legislator who has no idea what we've been talking about all day and hasn't even know the bill's moving and all of a sudden you let them know and they're interested and they get involved and they interact with their constituents. I'm sorry, I just, 
I will never accept that this is a legitimate process for true legislating in a citizen legislature. This is not human scale democracy. I will participate without objection, duly noted. Does that answer your question? Um, thank you, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna get into the redundancy about the so-called loophole, except to say that the, um, the Administrative Procedures Act and other administrative executive orders have dictated a process by which the NICS check system has to be reflective of the data that's available, responsive to the form, and it has to obey the law. So it obeys the law. If folks are deeply upset about the fact that uh, a hold can be X number of days and then the transfer can go ahead, they need to take that up with Senator Leahy and with, with, with Representative Welch and Senator Sanders to have that changed to the statutory federal level. It's not an issue that should be changed locally because you don't have the depth of understanding and you, and you really are trampling on other people's rights when they get delayed by a federal bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is quite good, on the other hand, as Henry will, I believe, agree with me, is quite good at identifying people who are prohibited. And more often than not, the prohibited negatives um, either don't come in the room and fill out the form because they already know they're, they're prohibited, or immediately upon getting a negative, you don't see them again. So um, it's quite good at doing that. And the refusal rates over the years have increased and improved. And I think Henry will back me up on that. Um, backing up a little bit to um, some earlier testimony, and this is not a criticism of them, um, just I felt there were some um, gaps. Um, Devin Green responded to some oblique questions about hospitals and how they handle current policy. Every hospital facility in the state of Vermont of any import um, has the signs, does not allow firearms. She knows that, and no one asked her that directly, but I wanted to just point that out. Now, as you get into the weeds on the definitions and statute that Chris got into and Eric Fitzpatrick earlier, there are minor facilities such as my physical therapist, which may or may not be affiliated, affiliated with a hospital organization, but they certainly have the right to put a sign up. Now, whether they do or not, they have the exact same rights as the other hospital facilities to restrict firearms, to call the police if somebody appears not to comply, put the, the gun back in their car, as is the case with the dollar store and the state house. Um, right now, the state house's mask rule is enforced theoretically by the same mechanism that Chris so um, nicely outlined earlier under um, 13, uh, 13 BSA 3705, which is we ask you to comply. If you refuse to comply, we ask you to egress. If you refuse to egress, we may have already called the police and you will be cited for misdemeanor trespass and arrested and then released with a citation to appear. That's the process that's been the process. I've used it as a bartender 20 years ago. And thank God I never had to use it as a security personnel at Copley Hospital, another job that I did have. And I, I mean, if everybody in the room raises their hands that used to work security at a hospital, I think it's just me. So that brings me to my next point, which is hospitals have a variety of security personnel and a variety of security processes and contingency plans. Now, most of them are with regards to mass casualty events where you know there's a large bus accident and they, they deal with these things as they can. Certainly they've had to uh, create contingency plans under COVID for various reasons, not the least of which is visitation rules within the patient wards and the patient hallways, but they're perfectly capable of anticipating people who come in perhaps drunk with a big cut on their leg. Maybe they call a cop just to come by and be there available to de-escalate in the event that that happens. Um, they're very aware of it. They're very proactive about it, but certainly if a person comes in and has a gun on their hip when the jacket opens and they ask them to put it in the car, um, is, is I've asked around and in the last year since this bill, 15 months since this bill was proposed, there have been zero events that we're aware of in police reports of anything getting beyond the, oh, you're not allowed to have a gun in here, please put it back in your car. So 
as was the case before the bill was proposed, there is no problem, but there is a statutory and criminal process in place already to deal with it that works quite adequately and has been affected at times. Under 13 VSA 3705, a person who refused to leave the state house during the special session was asked to leave, refused to leave and asked what would happen if they didn't and they were told they'd be arrested and they asked for the civil disobedience purpose to be arrested and cited. It worked just fine. You can check in with your chief. It was a very peaceable event, but it's an example of civil disobedience, but it's the same rule, the same statute and the same penalty that's used to apply for people who refuse to comply with these rules of attendance, no shirt, no shoes, no service is the same. It's the same process. It's an old law. It works fine. If someone has criminal intent, as Chris Bradley pointed out earlier, there are a myriad of charges and the police would be involved and called immediately by hospital personnel and confrontations. Uh, a little bit of a hobgoblin. Um, it was very rare that I was called as security to deal with confrontational issues in the ER. More often than not, they were de-escalated by the extremely knowledgeable and professional caring practitioners, whether it was the nurses, the LNAs, or the doctors themselves. Someone comes in traumatized by a car accident, drunk, on drugs. Um, those situations are far more dangerous um, than almost any other event in an ER. And yet they deal with those all the time and they're highly trained to do so. Um, the few times that I was called as security to come to the emergency room, which seems to be the focal point of these discussions. Uh, one of them was for me to sit, what I call Shiva, just sit at the end of the bed, uh, blocking the door for a young man who had tried to commit suicide with some pills of some sort. He happened to be a young man that I knew from my church youth group when I ran the youth group. But that, that's more typical of the situations that a security person in a hospital, um, a small hospital would deal with, um, or just making checking doors. I mean, we don't, at Copley, we didn't have a full-time security personnel. We were cross-trained in what was called the politely referred to as facilities. So while one day a year we'd have a cross-training with takedowns and restraints by a training officer from Newport State Prison, half the day was used cleaning hallways and offices, but we were on site and we did checks and we were there in the event that a situation um, the staff didn't feel that they had the de-escalation training or the restraint training to deal with it. And so I, I give you all that just to let you know that these hospitals are quite well prepared for these events. Um, no one can train or write a law to stop a mass shooter, whether they go into a theater or they go to a concert or they go to a school. That's not what we're discussing here. And any references to mass shooters earlier in the testimony is really besides the point. So um, to end that sort of part of my testimony, I just wanna add that uh, certainly no one here, uh, Representative Knott's amendments or, or, or Senator uh, uh, um, Baruth's earlier uh, versions of the bill was intended to deal with criminal activity or uh, advanced altercations uh, due to drugs or fights or whatever. Certainly this was meant to deal with keeping the public apprised of the hospital's desire to behave in a lawful manner. And one of the lawful manners was to not bring your firearm into the buildings. It's really been no more um, complex than that. And as I've, I think outlined, the existing statutes allow for a myriad of options and responses to that, regardless of training of the personnel at a hospital. Um, I wanted to point something out that I think Henry mentioned, but when FFLs do uh, do feel a little itchy on the back of their necks, um, they have the right to refuse at all points of the process to sail to anyone without any risk of being called to the mat for failure to sell. 
uh, pretty much pretty much a broad authority and discretion. Is that correct, Henry? So like a bartender who can refuse to serve, and I've done that too, um, that that's there and they're really superbly qualified, particularly when their hair is already up on the back of their neck for a long delay. Um, somebody comes in and uh, depending on their behavior, they can suggest to them that they go elsewhere. Um, I wanted to um, speak uh, probably the most of the rest of my uh, time to the amendment with, especially with regards to the mental health issues. Um, but I did want to point out, um, if I can find my paperwork. Uh, so last year we had an interrogatory with Eric Fitzpatrick regarding the ability to charge a person with trespass and uh, responding to a specific question. Um, Eric said, it's true that the sign is enough to provide notice against trespass under 3705. And he and I researched it and we came up with a case that's known as State v. Pixley, 208 Vermont 529. And it states in part, the statute allows notice of trespass to be given by actual communication or by signs or placards so designed and situated as to give reasonable notice. This is the court, Supreme Court of the state of Vermont speaking. We conclude that the statute allows notice to be proven with the objective evidence of reasonable notice through signage and without showing that a defendant subjectively saw and understood the signs. We reached this conclusion foremost from the plain language of the statute, which allows the state to demonstrate notice in several ways, including through, quote, actual communication by law enforcement or the person in lawful possession of the, of the premises or by signs that provide reasonable notice. So if that's not clear enough to everybody, you don't have to take my word for it up to this point. There it is. I've forwarded this document and several others that were from the Senate Judiciary Committee to uh, Amber recently. So those will be posted later in the afternoon. Um, I wanted to point out also that there's no rush on this bill as it is not subject to crossover since it is a Senate bill. Um, there, there is no rush. So waiting, my suggestion and my strong urging to wait for a more open process and a more in the building process really doesn't put you up against any particular rules. Um, and one more brief point before I get to the, the mental health issue. Um, Chris Bradley's um, friendly amendment uh, regarding educational events, educational, historical and competitive events. Um, I fully support the alternate language that he proposed. Um, part of the reason is because I'm involved in a club in Eden that also is trying to build what is incorporated as the Vermont Military History Museum, which will be on site. Um, it's not gonna be a big fancy museum like the Barry Historical Society or whatever like that. It's, it's gonna be some machinery, some equipment. Um, some, you know, memorabilia, military, a small building that'll also function as a clubhouse. And it's a, pro it's a work in progress, but it, it will involve uh, educational events, historical reenactments, and so on that may or may not include up and in through World War II in Korea, which would involve that magazine issue. So that's, that's why we strongly support the idea of having historical um, and educational events included in that, Madam Chair. I just want to follow up with Chris on that. So um, I'd like to use what, what time I have left to discuss the issues of the mental health counseling. The existing statutes that were referred to earlier by Eric, uh, the federal statutes are of interest. I don't profess to understand them completely, but I think they were pretty well explained. The state statutes, um, let me click something up here for myself here just for a second. So I did my initial research and I've confirmed this with among other people and Donahue to make sure that I'm not completely off track or completely ill-informed here. With regards to, um, and this document was forwarded to you earlier, there's, it's a, I think it's listed as comments on not amendment. Um, but I wanna refer to this Peck versus counseling services. And I, I think I'll just read my, my commentary um, from here. Um, that you, you've, you've received it, but it's, it's easier for me not to rewrite the book. 
So essentially the not amendments uh, will radically extend the quote duty to notify or quote duty to protect for the extreme risk protection order statutes to a demand side incursion into the doctor patient realm. Currently citizens, abuse victims, the family and spouses may initiate, pardon me for that noise. Currently citizens, abuse victims, the family and spouses may initiate with state's attorneys these red flag orders. The proposal would irreparably harm the confidentiality between all patients in most types of counseling, including depression, addiction recovery, family members seeking help with anger management, sometimes court ordered. Even the debate of these amendments will leak, in, leak to people now considering seeking help and trigger fear that discussion about suicidal thoughts and ideations will trigger the automatic filing of ERPOs via the source of their counselors and doctors. As with similar problems with H610 and judges feeling pressured to check the box on all cases, mental health care providers will fear the risks of not erring on the side of quote, duty to protect. Existing liability protections for practitioners who do report threats to others are apparently based largely on the PEC v counseling services case cited below. PEC v. Counseling Services appears to balance confidentiality in a way that creates and protects practitioners who feel compelled to warn those in danger with continuation of care under a confidential model. This is an excerpt from that court case decision. This case was from 1985, but I have confirmed with two sources that it is still uh, ruling law and it works in concert with the existing state statutes that you've had a primer on this morning. Quote, in the same manner that due care must be exercised in the therapist's determination of what steps may be necessary to protect the potential victim of a patient's threat of harm, so too must due care be exercised in order to ensure that only that information which is necessary to protect the potential victim is revealed. Thus, we hold that a mental health professional who knows or, based upon the standards of the mental health profession, should know that his or her patient poses a serious risk of danger to a, an identifiable victim, has a duty to exercise reasonable care to protect him or her from that danger. That is a very strong admonition to act, but carefully and firmly balanced with a very limited, narrow allowance of disclosure. That's, that's when, it, when they get their licenses, and they're operating and they're responsible in their oath and their licensing applications. Those are the words they're, at, they're, they're, they're taking responsibility for. This is the ruling law. I see nothing in the not amendment that can improve on that. I only see something that can create an impetus to check the box for practitioners. Uh, that's getting bad. For practitioners to feel pressured to act when the balance of their instincts might be to continue to counsel or more intensively involve the family members. Or at least in this case, if you read that again yourselves in a quiet moment, you'll see in that case, the, um, the conditions of the case and the, and the uh, circumstances of the case allowed, for instance, if Kate was, Kate, if Representative Donnelly was was counseling somebody and was aware of it, it encourages them if they have access to the person who may be the direct object of the threat to contact, contact them directly, which would also engage them to some degree in the troubles of this person. But it wouldn't disconnect or short circuit by going to the police and triggering an ERPO process, which would break the relationship with the practitioner and the client into ashes. And so, I mean, you really have a problem that doesn't exist. And the fix for it really is quite destructive and disruptive to the current process that, that clients and practitioners have developed over decades. I mean, these are professionals telling them what to do in a in set of circumstances that are always unique is very risky. So I think I've, I think I've made enough of that. Um, 
but I would urge you to finish and read the rest of what I've given you. Um, I guess I guess my my final comment would be if I read the definitions of a hospital or healthcare facility, um, if this passes next time I'm sitting at the end of a bed with a kid who committed suicide or tried to, and he wakes up and realizes it's me and he knows me, we have a deep long-term relationship now. He's a very healthy young man and he survived his crisis. But if he came to me today and said, I've relapsed, I'm a mess, Bill, help me. I don't know who to go to. I would tell him to go to a pastor. I would tell him to go to a religious group um, because he wouldn't be subjected to this because they're exempted from that in the state law. They're exempted from the liability questions. If you look at the definitions, they are not considered uh, hospital facilities. So I would just tell him to steer clear. Um, and, and go back to to his uh, his roots, which is where I met him. Uh, I'd hate to have to feel that way, but I, and I am using a little bit of hyperbole here, but I'm making my point that you're getting involved in a situation in a profession I think is highly nuanced, uh, perhaps even spiritual, um, even with practitioners who are professionals, where there's a there's an interpersonal uh, dynamic that you can't write a law and anticipate the circumstances. You, you'll only be disrupting it. Do you have any questions about any of the subjects of the bill? I'm happy to discuss them, obviously. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, I see that your hand is up. I'm shutting my phone off. I know it's been making a lot of noise and I apologize. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, when you mentioned that about shipping, it Ring a bell with me too. And so I have gone back through some of my old notes and I also just Googled shipping guns. And I'm finding a lot that if that somebody can have a gun shipped from you from FedEx, from um, the Postal Service, I'm seeing it on the ATF site, to a registered um, seller. And so I'm very confused about why that earlier issue about um, the delay would hamper a sale um, for someone at the gun show. Like, what am I missing? So you can, you're correct, uh, Representative Rachelson, you're absolutely correct. Um, if you, let's say you came up to the gun show and you're from New York State, um, you would probably likely have the gun transferred by shipping it to another FFL who would complete the background check there on the site. But the, the, the additional cost of the time of the transfer isn't probably as, as cumbersome as it is. Um, I think a lot of those people um, would choose to buy locally. So it, it's a little, it's, it's an example that's worth noting, but it's really not, it's not that cumbersome. People travel a long ways to a gun show. They already know they're gonna have to deal with it that way. Um, on the other hand, a private sale can be done as well that way. But it's still, again, I have to take it into Henry and say, I'm shipping it to my brother in Las Vegas he's gonna pick it up at this shop. That shop would complete the background check there on site and there would be quite a lot of cost. Barbara seems to be muted. Um, so that seems to only be um, needed if somebody is from out of town or from downstate and doesn't wanna stay in, I don't know why they wouldn't wanna just extend their stay in Barry for a few days, but um, <laughs> If they don't, then in those situations, there would be an additional cost, but but it wouldn't shut down the gun shows and we should be careful about framing it that way. Um, because I was like, I've been in FedEx when people have mailed guns, before. like I've watched them, I've seen it happen. So anyway, so thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Well, I, I agree, I understand Brad your and point. I weren't like yeah. losing our yeah. minds here. I think I, I think what Henry was trying to say that you know if you look at the statistics, Chris Bradley knows these better than I do. Um, if you look at the statistics for gun sales, uh, the infinitesimal less than one percent that um, get delayed or refused um, aren't the issue. Um, there are gun show, um, there are vendors there. People like Henry Perro set up tables and they have telephones and they can do background checks and swipe 
credit cards and sell guns to legitimately sure. um, approved sellers. And that's 90, 90% of what they do during that gun show. So yes, it will destroy right. those gun shows because those gun dealers will no longer attend. It's not worth the trouble because of the, they, they barely make much from gun shows anyway, because they, they rip up their existing point of sale retail location and then they close it and then they come to the gun show and it's sort of a distrib- you know it's a visibility but they lose all that if they can't sell guns all day they, they just won't come and the gun shows won't be gun shows they'll be shows with people selling old leather holsters and that, that'll be the end of it that it's okay. true I, i've worked them i know trust me yeah. well thank you i um it's a different reason. Okay, but. Yeah, but um, but thank you, for for clarifying because I um, it helped clarify when I heard Mr. Perro say, "You can't just mail a gun." I believe that was his his testimony. So no, so now I know. In fact, um, it, it, yeah, it's like, just about yeah. sales. It really is. Yeah. So um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we will now turn to uh, Mr. Jeffrey Whalen. Good afternoon, and thank you for thank you for your time. Waiting. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, am I able to be heard all right? Thank you. Uh, technical challenges, always technical challenges, so best to best to verify. So for the record, my name is Jeffrey Wallen, and I'm the director of the Vermont Crime Information Center with the Department of Public Safety. And I'm here really to provide a little bit of background uh, information about how the criminal records that VCIC holds feeds into uh, the firearm background process, and then really answer any questions that I can. I'll begin simply by saying that we do not undertake background checks for firearm purchases here at VCIC or at the state level. They are all handled, as was mentioned earlier, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation's uh, National Incident Background Check System, or NICS, as you'll hear it generally referred to. VCIC is the criminal history for, uh, repository, excuse me, for Vermont, does provide information that's used in that, but we actually don't undertake those checks ourselves. So just to be absolutely clear on that, <clears throat> on that piece uh, moving forward. I did provide some information on the number of background checks that were conducted um, by the FBI on behalf of Vermont earlier, and I'm happy to quickly review those uh, with the committee. In 2020, uh, the FBI NICS section conducted uh, 57,965 firearm checks on behalf of Vermont. And of those in 2020, those just over 57,000, there were 476 denials of those, which represents 0.82% of the checks conducted during that time. Furthermore, of those checks, 56,771, or 97.1%, were completed within three days. For 2021, I have information through November. I have not updated for December yet through the publicly available sources. There were just, well, there were just, excuse me, there were 46,966 checks completed um, through November for 2021. There were 337 denials, and 46,518 were completed within three business days. Additionally, during the same period noted, which is 2020 and through the first 11 months of 2021, there were 28 firearm retrievals issued to ATFE. And as of the time when I pulled data together earlier in December, 19 had been completed at that time. So that's some basic, just basic publicly available information on the number of checks that are done on behalf of Vermont. Um, it averages about 45 and 4,800 checks per month uh, between 2020 and 2021. But beyond that, really, I just want to answer any questions that I can for the committee members and appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions? Uh, let's see. Um, Martin and then Tom. And then Ken, did you? Yeah, okay, so Martin, Tom, and Ken. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for testifying today. Could, could you just explain the information that you provide into the system or you provide you know, just a brief overview of, 
of uh, what information is provided through your organization to the NIC system? Absolutely, absolutely. So there's two primary things that we provide uh, with regards to information available to NICS. Uh, the first are criminal history records. So it's the record of an arrest, arraignment, and conviction of an individual that's made available. It's what we commonly refer to as a rap sheet. You know, that's what's commonly referred to as a rap sheet. So that information is made available to the FBI NICS section for determination if the individual has any kind of uh, federal or state disqualifier. Now that's the primary thing that we do. We also annotate any record where the individual has a felony conviction. We annotate that so it's immediately known to them that an individual has a felony conviction on their record. So those are the primary records that BCIC makes available to the FBI NIC. Thank you. Uh, Tom and then Ken. Thank you. Hey, Jeffrey, how you doing? Good, sir. Yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. So uh, those numbers you were throwing out, their uh, background checks were in like the 40, 50,000 range. Was that what it was? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm going to assume that uh, the private sales are included in those. And, and is there a number, do you have a number of how many of those were what I call private sales? Uh, I don't know if they're a private sale or not, but because they're going through the uh, uh, FFLs, but is there a number for that by any chance? There, it, there, uh, Representative, it's a great question. Uh, the FBI on the FBI NICS webpage, right on their publicly available page, they do have that information. I did not look it up before this meeting, but they do okay. break down the number of private sales on behalf of Vermont. Um, when I did look at it a long while ago, there, there is a number. They're, they are doing them and recording them. Um, on that, but I don't, I couldn't tell you the number they did for the last two years, but it's readily available right on the FBI NICS webpage. Okay, great. And, and I'm going to guess it's fairly substantial since uh, Henry was saying that he does, I think he said he did 200 alone. So just his gun shop. So, um, so it's really it's pulling a lot of people into the system and making people more accountable, which was the, um, uh, uh, the idea of the law anyway, but um, well, let's see. So do you know if anybody has uh, doing a private transaction without an FFL? Has there, do you know if there's been any, any cases of people being uh, uh, charged or prosecuted or arrested or whatever, whatever term you want to use for not using an FFL? I'm not aware of that, but I wouldn't necessarily be. Um, that's not information that I would necessarily be privy to. So that would be something that either the state police or the ATF would be able to answer better. Right. Okay. And um, I guess I guess that's it right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Jeffrey. Um, to go back to your figures, what did you say 2020 was? 57,965? Yes, sir. There were 57,965 checks in 2020 conducted. So that's a lot closer to 60,000 60, than 50. So then um, what was 2021 again through November? Through November uh, 2021 was 46,966 checks. So close to uh, 50,000. So these are actual gun sales that go with an FFL or just an FFL? Well, these are the number of checks that are processed by the FBI next section. I wouldn't necessarily equate each one to an actual purchase. An individual may decide not to complete the purchase for whatever reason, et cetera. They're simply verifying whether they're eligible or not. Um, I may defer to some of the other folks that spoke earlier who actually are involved in the actual sales of firearms to speak to whether or not that happens or whether or not every uh, single sale, well, let me rephrase that, um, every single check results in a sale. It may be a check that's done, but it does not result in a sale. Okay, thank you. Um, so my other question is, we, we've had this uh, situation going on now for a couple of years. 
our systems are antiquated and all this stuff, our computers and all this stuff. Do you anticipate any problem at all? I mean, it sounds like you're on top of everything with us, that we are keeping the public safe in my mind. The information that we, when we receive information, so thank you, Representative, it's a good question. Um, we have a fairly sophisticated operation here as far as making these records available, but we don't generate them ourselves. They come from the courts and they come from law enforcement agencies, so we're as good as the data that we receive, uh, and we do think, then make that information available in essentially real time to our federal partners. So as long as we're getting data in a timely manner and an accurate manner, we make that then available to our federal partners. So just to be clear, that's uh, data that's coming from our Vermont uh, court system and our, our uh, law enforcement, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Thank you very much. Tom, it looks like you might have another question. No. <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> sorry. That's fine, no worries. Uh, committee members, any other, any other questions? I, I, I won't say I don't have another one. I'll say I don't have one right now. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Whalen. Good to see you. Thank you, ma'am. Good to see you as well. So, okay, committee, good timing. I think we, we have gotten through everybody. There's quite a bit of information from our witnesses on our committee page. Um, so uh, <clears throat> please make sure to, to look there and I will update you as we get more, um, if we do get any more submitted. And we are on the floor at three. So let's uh, adjourn today.